I'll give you a little bit of uh, background, and then we'll talk about the page that's in front of you, which is the cupping form that we're going to use today. Then we'll go outside and we'll cup some coffee. We'll come back here and we'll calibrate. Sound good? Okay. I want to tell you a little bit about CQI and the Q program to give you some context for why we cup this way. I know there are uh, at least three Q graders who are around here, rattling around two or rattling around in this room. I am one, obviously. But how have many of you heard of uh, have heard the term Q grader or Q system of coffee? Okay. And how many of you feel like you understand what it is? Okay. <laughs> and this is one of our issues, I think. CQI Coffee Quality Institute is a nonprofit development agency that is based on coffee. And our mission statement is to improve coffee and the, the lives of the people who produce it worldwide. So while the Specialty Coffee Association of America or maybe NRF or many of you in this room are pretty well dedicated to specialty coffee, specifically, coffee that's pretty high end and the good stuff, Coffee Quality Institute is interested in bringing all coffee up. So we talk about all kinds of coffee and making it better. Um, and one way we've done this is maybe about 10 years ago, after many years of development and research, there were a group of volunteers who created a system for actually giving concrete parameters around specialty. Because we've heard this word specialty, all, the, all our lives in coffee, but there never was really a definition until about 10 years ago. And how many of you knew there was actually a concrete definition to specialty? Specialty coffee, right? There actually is. It exists in the world. We'll talk about that in a second. Let me tell you about why we bother to score this way and why this was developed. It has become an internationally recognized protocol for evaluating coffee, meaning the green coffee, so it's a sampling, roast sample evaluation before it goes to the roaster. It's an evaluation for green coffee. So let's take a look at um, the system of coffee, the coffee value chain as we know it. This is kind of, I wouldn't say this is the way it is for everybody, but this is kind of the traditional thing. The traditional, and I mean all coffee. Coffee that some of you would consider commercial and some of you consider, don't even consider at all. This is the kind of system we have. We have producers that don't really know what they have. And they give it off to the millers. And the millers just do their job. And then you move over to exporters and importers. And the exporters and importers usually start to decide what the quality is right about there. And then moving on to roaster retailers, they decide. And then the con consumers are the final say in who decides quality. So what you have here is all of these people here, not really sure how they're making money or why they're making the money the way they are, or how even to make the coffee that we want. This isn't really the case with specialty because we're a lot more open, but in most of the world it's still like this for most coffee in the world. And that impacts us as specialty buyers and specialty drinkers. So what we want to do is train people to find specialty coffee at the very beginning. Can you find specialty coffee before you give it to your mill so that it can be separated, separated out? Can you find the exporter and importer that recognizes that specialty coffee and keeps it separated and gives it a differential that will help? And does the roaster understand here, the buyer here, understand what this guy says when he talks about his coffee? Sometimes we have good relationships with producers. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we find a gem that we don't know if we'll find it again next year. And then we just say, I hope it's the same next year. Maybe they made it so well this year it was an accident. I hope they know how to do it again. Gee, I hope I get that coffee again, I don't know. Maybe I'll have to switch to another producer because they kind of didn't do it again this year. So how do you do this? You improve the differentiation across the board, and you give everybody sort of one set of, of parameters and a language to speak. 
so that it mitigates any kind of rejection or misunderstandings on a very, very kind of common level when we're just talking about coffee, which is what we call calibration. Now, I don't want to bore you too much with this stuff, but I want to tell you that this system starts with cupper training here, and it goes into the Q grading system. Right about here is where the coffee gets graded by Q graders. And then there's a link to the market. And then at the very end, if you chose to be one of those people that has a Q on their coffee bag, then the consumer knows it's a Q coffee. It's just one of those marks, you know, like fair trade or any of these other marks. But this mark is specifically for the quality of coffee and nothing else. It's the only one that I know of that is only about quality coffee, and it's based on this system. So I'm going to escape this one, and I'm going to go straight to this one, calibration presentation. So when you give, um, the, Q, the Q system gives a certification to cuppers. It's one thing it does. It also gives a certification to coffee. But how you get the certification for coffee, you have to certify the cuppers who grade the coffee. And so that's what the Q system is. So if you're Q grader, which Maria is, and Dennis is, and I am, uh, you can actually grade on the system and report on the coffee that you were given. And that gets a certification. Now, certification for specialty coffee is 80 points or above with zero primary defects, no defects whatsoever, except for some secondary defects are allowed. And that's the kind of thing you learn if you go through the training. But what we're going to do today is just do kind of a basic cupping based on this cupping form, which is we're going to score the coffee and see if we can come to a better language. But I kind of want to get right to this cupping form, which is what we're going to use. So I might just go right to here. It's not a full class. We're going to explain the categories analyzed by the cupping form. You know, this is the FDA. That last part of the name America is a little bit deceiving because the Specialty Coffee Association of America is made up of people from all over the world. And in fact, the people that developed this standard for cupping are people, essentially some Americans, but there were Brazilians, um, Colombians, Central Americans, and Europeans that were involved in creating this system. Um, and it took many years to do. So it was a collaborative effort. And it was based on the idea that worldwide we could come to some conclusions about specialty. We want to score accurately the coffee by using the form, which is just a tool. And again, this is a tool that is for green coffee analysis. So if you're a roaster and you try to use this form for your production cupping, it's probably not the best tool. You know, you go to your toolbox and you want to hammer a nail, you pick out a wrench, you start hammering, you might hammer the nail in, but the wrench is not the best tool for that. So I want to kind of leave you with the idea that there are all kinds of cupping forms in the world. You know, some of you might have been at the NBC in Oslo where you had the presentation about COE cupping form. Have you been there? Or you at least you saw it online? That's a cupping form that is great for what it does. It creates a way to, it's already been screened coffee, so there's a lot of stuff on that's not on their form that's on this form, and I'll kind of point those things out. But it's good for finding um, competition coffee winners. That's what that one's for. There are co coffee um, companies all over the world that create their own in-house cupping form. This one is specifically for evaluating on a quality scale 80 and above and eliminating anything that wouldn't be that. And, um, that's why I just kind of want to leave you with the idea that this is not the one that you just go to for everything. And you may decide you don't like this one, and that's fine. But just so you know it exists, think about it like learning a different language. You know, we're in coffee, we have a lot of languages to learn. We literally have to learn languages if we want to travel maybe to Latin America and buy coffee. You might want to learn Spanish. This is a different language, which is beneficial because CQI has 
developed this program over 10 years and we are in Brazil and Central America and Africa and in Indonesia and all over the world, people have learned this. I want to demonstrate the protocols which, interestingly enough, are pretty universal even if they're not specifically FDA protocols for cupping. Many of you are already doing these things even if you've never learned formally the SCAA protocols because they're so pervasive and everyone agrees on them so well that they already exist probably in your mind and we'll go for some of those. We want to show that we understand clean, sweet, and uniform in coffee cupping and this is what I call the basic, this is like your basic starting point. This is your foundation. Clean, sweet, and uniform. And that's at the exporter level where they say export. And anything that's not going to hit that, they just say keep it here or do something else with it. So clean, clean, sweet, and uniform means this. Once we have, yes, it's exportable, then we start to build the case for specialty. So we've probably hit 80 at that point. 80 points. And then from there we build it. And how do we build the case for specialty? And that's what this form does. It gives you a platform to build your case, kind of like you're a lawyer. Why do you want to spend so much money on this coffee? Maybe you have to give this to your boss and say, I need this coffee. It's the best Honduras I've tasted all year. And here's the proof. Or maybe you have to communicate with your exporter and say, this one did not hit it this year. It's not like it was last year. Here's my cupping formula from last year. And here it is this year. Read it and see what happens. And that's what's great about this system, is if you really delve, which this form will make you do, it will make you compartmentalize, it will make you focus, you can actually report on every single thing that influences the flavor of the coffee. So clean, sweet, uniform, I want you to think of it as this. That's where we start, and if you find that on the table, then you can start building a case. We want to identify any Paints or faults that might be on the table that may or may not be there. And some of us in specialty really have not had very much experience with paint or fault because our importers give us what we ask for. We say we want the best stuff. Don't send me anything that's not great. And so many of us have little experience tasting these things. So that when you do get them, you're not even sure what that is. And you look around and you say, did anyone else get that? Because that's a weird cup. And then no one wants to say, so no one's not, no one's very used to seeing that. On the exporter level, they get that all the time. So it screens it before it gets to us. Remember, they do that for that. So we're only getting this anyway to start with. Occasionally that stuff sneaks in, and when it hits you, you're, you're kind of not used to it. You're not ready for it. And you don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to punish the coffee for it. Sometimes people just draw a line through. I know with... Uh, COE, because I've been on those panels, they just ask you to draw a line and don't report on that coffee. Just stop tasting it. At CQI, we have a mandate that we have to help people make their coffee better. So if I have, if I'm a producer and I get a report back and someone started to report on the coffee and then the line's drawn through, what have I learned from you, the buyer? What can you help me do in the future? So what if I had um, a coffee that scored 80, 86. The next year, it scores 75. Because there are taints and a fault. If you're a buyer who knows what taints and faults is, and you can actually get in, in your career, learn what those things are, you can report on that and say, you have fermentation issues. I'm getting a lot of fermentation this year. And I don't want that ever again, so I'm not going to buy your coffee, but here's why I rejected it, exactly why, then that farmer or that producer can get some help, and then they're 86 again next year. And this is important for all of us, because some of us have been trained to say, it's not specialty, it's none of my business, or it's commercial, it's none of my business, that's for other people to worry about. But what if you have a coffee that's hovering at 78, year after year after year, and for years the producer knows, does not know why the coffee is 78. And someone comes in and gives them a full technical report. Some of it has to do with the cupping form, but some of it is also someone visits the farm and says, 
You know what? You need to clean your tanks better. Your fermentation tanks are horrible. You know, this is the kind of thing that if you put it all together, the next year that farmer gets well into specialty and they can realize prices that make their life better. And that's what this is about. So we're trying to get you to not ignore or draw a line through defect. It's everybody's problem. Yeah, so think about it like that. Okay, we're gonna do this. Blah, 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 blah. Why score was this company for? This is a woman in Ethiopia years ago when I went there to train. And I was just there before I came here. This is one of those bad PowerPoints that gives you lots of words to read, but I can tell you what this says. Um, Basically, we want to help support the price points that we want to specialty. We want to create a language that everyone can speak and understand throughout the value chain. Uh, we want to explore the coffee fully. We want to report on everything about the coffee, and I'll get back to that in a second. And to better understand certain reports that come out, whether they are technical reports or Q certified loss or Ethiopian commodity exchange, some of these people are using the forms um, formally. What is calibration? What is calibration? Can anyone <coughs> put it in a quick sentence? What is calibration? To get everybody on the same page? Get everybody on the same page about coffee? <coughs> and does that mean we agree 100% with each other? Do you have to you have to win an argument in a calibration system. What do you think? It's kind of like a compromise, but not really. What we're trying to do is to say calibration is as if, if someone said to you at the cupping table, I, I have all kinds of fruit in this cup. Yeah, me too, I taste them so fruity. Wow, it's the most fruity cup ever. Yeah, it's just like peaches, as the other guy goes, it's lemon. So you've agreed on fruity, and what you're kind of not calibrated on is what kind of fruit. And I think that most people can calibrate on those terms, but the language that we use is important. So if I go to Mexico and I say, oh, I'm tasting so much blueberry in this cup, and the Mexican cupper says to me, ah, we don't have blueberries here, we have guava, and we have papaya, what the heck is a blueberry? And I can't bring blueberries there, right? And what sometimes we get, into our own culture. So I'm from the United States and we have a candy bar there called Snickers Bar. Has everybody had Snickers Bar? Has chocolate and caramel and peanuts and nougat. So a couple will just say, oh, it's so Snickers Bar. And then, you know, you're from Iceland and you say, we don't have, <laughs> we don't have that stupid ice, ice cream bar. What does it mean? What the couple is saying is that they taste peanuts and chocolate and caramel. So just say those things. That's what we want you to do. We want you to take it back and get more international. Just say the things you taste. And if that person doesn't understand what it is, they might offer, oh, if you're tasting blueberry, I'm tasting guava. Okay, it's fruited, we're calibrated. And that's what we mean by calibration. Some of that stuff is about calibrating on scores as well. <coughs> and we'll get to that also. Why <coughs> calibrate? It's important to debunk. You know the word debunk? to reject the idea that cupping is only subjective. That we come to the cupping table and everyone can have their opinion and that's just great. But the truth of the matter is that there is quality and there is no quality, or there are levels of quality. And it's our job as professionals to not be subjective. It's our job as those professional cuppers to be objective. And that's what this form helps us do. Cultures, blah, 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 we all know that help mitigate rejections, which is a horrible thing when that happens, and to support price points, and even raise price points. So we used to have this cupping form in SCAA that was just a line. This was before the, this cupping form that you have here is like from 2003. We've been using it for 10 years. Before that, it was just this. And you, you can see very closely, it says fragrance and aroma on the left, and goes across acidity, flavor, body, balance and cupper's points, but this doesn't really give you enough room to really report on the coffee. It doesn't tell you 
the, um, the, the nuance of the coffee doesn't tell you it has a fruited note, um, a sparkling acidity. It doesn't tell you if it has a buttery body. It doesn't have any place for you to put that there. It doesn't tell you um, about the kind of body it is, just, that it's a, just the level of body. We need to know about intensity and if it's a good quality body or a bad quality body. Because sometimes you have a very heavy, intense body, but it doesn't balance well in the cup, so it's a low quality. And then it doesn't punish for defects, which we kind of have to do. We have to all get a little bit more in tune with what defect is. So here's the cupping form. It's a little bit daunting. It looks crazy. And this was the form I meant to print out, but I've been very scatterbrained lately, so I apologize. The form you have in front of you has three spaces. And we have four copies out there. So I had the wrong one printed, but it's all right. We can calibrate vertically <coughs> on both of them. Uh, and it looks crazy, but we're going to go through it point by point. And you can take notes on the side of your cupping form there. The first thing I want you to look at is the upper right hand corner where it says the classification for scale. And this is where a lot of people already get hung up. They start off saying, how does how, does, how do things start at six? How do things start at six? Well, in the specialty world, world, we're starting at six, and we start at good. And I want you to remember that this means good in the whole world of coffee. And if you're someone who's not used to tasting commercial coffees, um, this can be strange for you, the, the idea that the worst coffee on the table would already be good for you. But that's kind of true. It's kind of true for us. We're in a bubble of specialty. Probably haven't had very many cruddy coffees in your life, which is great, but it makes this hard thing for me to explain to you, and that six is where we start, and we call it good. If you don't want to uh, worry about that, don't. Most of our coffees are kind of probably be in the seven, eight range, and what I also want you to do is only use quarter points, and if you can possibly do it, just use half and whole points. Eliminate the quarter points. Because one of the things we have to do in this business is we have to make decisions. And why not just go for a half and a whole point? That's enough shade to grade, right? Just make some decisions there. It makes it easier to add up at the end, too. Watch out for safe scoring. This is the thing that if you're a cube grader, you can be kicked off a table or fail a table uh, in your examination if you decide that every coffee is between 82 and 82. 84 points, just because you don't want to, say, reward and you don't want to punish. So you feel like if you stay under the radar, no one will notice you and you'll pass the test. That's what we call safe scoring. And if you want to be a safe scorer in your life, go ahead. But you're not useful as a Q grader. Let's read left to right. The very left-hand corner of your page, you'll see the spot that says sample. And this is where you put the sample code, obviously. And then directly to the right of that is roast. This is roast level. And there is a strict protocol also for cupping standard for SBAA. So the cupping standard, does anyone know that one by heart? Any cube readers know that? Cupping standard, Dennis knows it. What are the parameters for the cupping note? Shouldn't be right. Yes, it's nine to 12 minutes all stuff that can be found online easily. Um, by the way, we're using the Arabica form, because there is such a thing as an Arabica form. But I don't think you're very interested in that. So just forgot to tell you that one. This is the Arabica form. So this roast <coughs> level tells you if the roaster who sample roasted your coffee got it right, or they're a little bit off which case it could influence your scores. But at this point, the roast level is no value. It has no value. You don't score it with numbers. It's a, cupper's point. it's a cupper's note. So you just make a mark if you think the roast is too light or too dark. But these roasts should be just right. Fragrance and aroma, we divide those into two things. 
Fragrance and aroma fragrance is the dry smell of the coffee ground. Aroma is when it gets changed ever so slightly or sometimes dramatically with the chemical reaction of hot water added to it. And that's when the coffee rises to the top, becomes a crust, and the crust is the wet smell and the aroma. That's when the coffee is most volatile, when it's hot, when it wafts up into your nose. There's a trend lately that people like to wait for their coffee cools down a little bit before they drink it. Sometimes I watch the competitions online, and you have the barista or someone say, just wait. I've swirled the coffee for you so that it cools off, so then you can drink it, because it opens up when it cools off. This is great. But as cuppers, we need to cup when it's hot, because there are two ways into your nose. There's the front door and the back door. The front door is your nose. The back door is your retronasal area, which is behind your palate back here. And it has everything to do with how volatile the coffee is. When you slurp it, you get another added bonus of the back door, the retronasal. And when it's volatile, when it's hot, you can get that. This is why average people love hot coffee. It's not just because it's warm and comforting, but because there are certain aromas they will get when the coffee is hot. And we have to try to cup it while it's warm. As warm as you can stand it, not so bad that it burns your tongue. So we have a scale that's vertical. Anytime you see a vertical scale in this cupping form, that's almost your intuition, your intuitive reaction. If you like it, you make a mark for high. If you don't like it, you make a mark for low. If it's okay, right in the middle. And then right here under qualities, this gives you extra space to write aromas. And aromas are all those things that you are smelling in the coffee. This is also the beginning of the notes. The notes run all along the bottom of the cupping form. This is where we use words, and the words help everybody sell coffee. The words are also you making the case for your coffee, like you're a lawyer, like you have to convince your boss you want to buy it. The words are going to make it specialty. If you bust out at the end of this at 90 points and you have no words there for me, I don't trust your cupping evaluation. You give me a 72, and you don't put any words why, have 72, and I don't really trust a cupping about you. <coughs> Sorry. So vertical is always your intuitive, and then anything that's uh, horizontal is going to be your value judgment on that. So you're going to assess the dry, and then we'll get it wet, and then you break the crust, and you'll assess the aroma. And then those kind of those things together, along with the words that you have there, will give you a value. The value goes up in the right hand corner in the box, anywhere from 6 to 10. And uh, how do you know what number to put there? If you have a lot of great words, peach, um, caramel, chocolate, <coughs> flowers, floral, all these great words, then you're going to have at least an eight, if not more. If you have four different things that are complex and work together well in that aroma, you're into the 8.5s. If you have chocolate, which is like the most pedestrian thing you can put, like chocolate smell, some of you just think it's boring, but you're already at, you're already at like 7.5. Like that's good. Like that means that it's going to be a sweet coffee, probably sound. If all cups smell chocolate, that's kind of great already. You're already somewhere. Don't overlook the obvious. <laughs> and that's how you do that one. You want to put the fragrance and aroma in there before you even clean the cups. You know, when you skim the cups with the spoons, you can wait until you get the score in there. I want, I want you to do that score before you move on to anything else. You can't come back to that. You can't come in at the end and put it in because you would have missed it. See. Okay, taste it. Hot, warm, and tepid. And this is where, if you're a professional, you have to learn to cup your coffee three times and do your best to cup it three times only, which is hard if you like the coffee. Now, if you like the coffee, maybe you come back for a fourth time. But what you're trying to do as a professional is to make decisions and not get the subjectivity rolling into your life. You know, it's not a cocktail party, I like to say. Cupping tables are not, it's not a big, fun cocktail party. It's different if you're doing something for your customers at your cafe and you're turning them on to coffee, that's different. This is uh, an environment where we have to make decisions and we have to build a case. And so everyone has to get all business, get all business about it. So three times, hot, warm,
warm and tepid. You can go back for maybe one more. It's not a crime, but I'm just saying. Horizontal, any horizontal scale is your value, and that goes in the box. And then you can see here, there are two other vertical scales in intensity for acidity and body. And these are the places where you can allow different coffees to be different. For example, one criticism of this form is that it was built on Colombian coffee, as if every coffee has to be Colombian. Like Colombian always scores well on this form, blah, blah, blah. People like to talk. The thing about this form is actually that it allows every coffee to be what it is and be valued for what it is. I was just in Ethiopia, and we had a lot of light-bodied Yirgacheff. And so the flavor was off the charts because it's so complex, right? We had nines for flavor because there was floral and there was tea-like flavors and there were fruit-like flavors and they were all coming together with a beautiful flavor. But when you got to body, the intensity was either medium or low in body, not heavy. It wasn't syrupy. It wasn't supple. It was supporting. It had a supporting role, but it wasn't off the chart. So we had a lower intensity, but because it was well balanced, it got a good quality score for body. And similarly, if you go to acidity while you're tasting an Indonesian coffee, which is prized for lower acidity, but a higher body, you could, yes? So you have to keep in mind what side we're talking about. Yes. Um, but it helps you compartmentalize what you're doing. But it, even if you did have totally blind samples, what you have to do is focus on what the balance is, right? So if you have a very high intensity of acidity, you may find that it's a medium or a lower in um, body. When those things are both high intensity, then you have to assess whether they're a good quality. And the quality is always the whole so this is what, this is my case for, you can score a Sumatra high, or Indonesian coffee high, on this one. It doesn't mean that every compartment has the same score. That's called backwards scoring. When you just taste the coffee, you go all the way in, you're right, oh, that's an 85 coffee. And then you add all the stuff up to add up to 85. You see what the problem is there? You haven't reported on the coffee. I don't know what the acidity is, or the body, or the fragrance or anything, because you just decided something at the end and went backwards. And then I kind of don't know what I have, if you tell me that. So we want to try to get you out of the, it can be something that you can do quickly in your, inside your own lab maybe, but uh, to go out into the world <coughs> and bust out the backwards scoring can confuse Yeah, you think it's far? Looks like that. Uh, Why? Because um, from what I'm hearing is that like you can score like a Sumatra coffee that is very heavy and doesn't have the you know the what we are looking for in specialty coffee, and you'll still score it very high. You score it high if it has good quality, not if it doesn't fit anything you want. If you don't like the Sumatra for the quality, then you score it low, of course, on this, but. It has been known to give good scores to Sumatra if the Sumatra is a good one. And there are good ones coming out. They do exist. <laughs> She's looking at me like, no, they don't. <laughs> 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 they do. They, there are more and more. Indonesia is really um, making strides. Just like a few years ago, I used to say horrible things about Honduras coffee. Horrible things. I never believed they could get their act together. Addie and I were talking about this. And within a year, everything changed for me. I, everything I was tasting from Honduras was amazing. I'm like, okay, now they're great. Peru has issues with how they get the, the cherry down to you know where they can dry it. There's all kinds of issues with Peru. Do you think they'll ever fix it? You have to give them the chance to fix it. So every time you come to the table and someone says, this is an Indonesia, all that stuff, that's your subjective stuff that's talking to you. 
There's a reason why they offered it to you, because they believe it's quality. So it's up to you to give it the chance that it deserves. So aftertaste and flavor. Now, after flavor is a high score if you, on your notes, have written many different complex flavors that go together, like chocolate and lemons and caramel, everything that comes together in your mouth, all these words, and they're all good words, and the flavor's going to be high. Flavor is a combination of your aroma and your uh, palate. So it's taste and aroma that work together as flavor. Aftertaste is after you expel, which everyone should expel or spit. Uh, how does it lay on your tongue? Pay attention to what are the sensors on your tongue that are still being excited or still enjoying the flavor of the coffee. Is the coffee sitting in the back of your tongue where it's bitter and laying there after aftertaste? That's a poor aftertaste. If it's sitting in the front of your tongue, if you're getting salty or you're getting brackish, that's not a good aftertaste. If it's sweet all over your mouth and you still have something in the retronasal that's hovering there, like it's floral or something, that's good. And then score goes up. Usually these are pretty well in sync with each other, flavor and aftertaste. <laughs> now here's the stuff I was telling you about, the exporter. This is your foundation for this or this. Right now, put aside balance for now. Don't talk about, we're not going to talk about balance. We're going to talk about uniformity, clean cup, and sweetness. You can see here there are five boxes. <coughs> On the SCAA cupping table, there are five cups in the sample. And you have to assess each cup. Obviously, for uniformity, do they all pretty much taste the same? They don't have to be identical, but they should taste pretty much the same. And if they don't taste the same, and you're new to setting up this protocol, you might ask yourself, is this a protocol issue, or a cupping issue, or a coffee issue? Meaning, if one cup seems weak, maybe some of the grounds got stuck in the grinder, didn't come out, and you didn't do your job to make sure all the cups were dosed correctly, that's a protocol problem. Don't punish the coffee for that. And I think you guys can get that far with it. So uniformity, that's where you would not, even if the cups are ununiform, you know enough to know that you may have made a mistake and you don't punish the coffee for uniformity in that sense, okay? Because this is pretty bad. This is pretty bad if you get one cup out. Each cup is two points. Two, four, six, eight, ten. If all cups are uniform, you put ten there. If all cups are clean, you put 10 there. If all cups are sweet, you put 10 there. Now this is counterintuitive for many people because they say, but that's not perfect. This is not about perfection. All it is is this or this. If, if you don't have a 30 here, 10, 10, and 10, you have this right away. So foundational, and if you know the COE form, you just add 30 at the end. This is kind of like that. This does not mean perfection, it just means you're you're where you're, you now you're at the starting point. Now you're at the now you're at the beginning of making your taste. So here's where you decide that, and it's a little bit further down in the cupping form because you do it when the coffee's kind of cooled off a tiny bit, and you can assess all cups for uniformity. If you have a cup out for clean, in other words, cup number two is unclean in some way, and you may or may not know what to call it. You may not know enough to know it's ferments or musty or earthy. You may not know the word because you don't have a ton of experience, but you know when one cup's off. And you have to call it out. So you put an X in it, and then your score goes to eight. And then if it's out on clean cup, it's absolutely out in uniformity. The same cup has to be out again. That's four points off. That's a pretty big deal, right? So you have to be sure that there's an issue there. If it's just that cups are a little bit like this, and there's no full problem with that, don't call it out because it's an agricultural product, and we dose the coffee with whole beans, so not everything is identical. So don't overreact to difference in the five cups. What I want to know is, is there a problem there? Just want to know if there's a problem there. And if it is, it's out on clean cup and out on uniformity. Sometimes it could be out on uniformity, but it's not a full-on defect, but you know it's a coffee issue, and that's legitimate. You may not decide it's unclean, but it is on uniformity. Does that make sense? If you have clean cup out, you must always have uniformity out. It doesn't necessarily go the other way. 
okay? And you only have multiples of two. 10, 8, 6. You can't put a 7 there. And you can't put, um, you know, 8.5 there. It's only multiples of two. Now, sweetness is an interesting issue as well, because in Arabica, coffee should be sweet. We're not talking about the level of sweetness. We're just talking about the presence of sweetness. Is this coffee sweet? It could have a very low level of sweetness, but it still gets a 10 there. And that, again, is very counterintuitive because people want to say, wait a minute, it's actually not very sweet. If it's not very sweet and you don't find it exceptionally sweet, but you found some level of sweetness there that you know could be better, punish it somewhere else, like in flavor or overall or aftertaste. But don't punish it there because, like I said, this is just Arabica. It's sweet. It's exportable. We're going to put something out there. Most of the time, all and that's the truth. It's uniform. You know, you feel like you want to make them all wrong, so you put a zero there. Like, but they all have to be different from each other to have out of uniform. There is a buyer for coffee. There's always a buyer for coffee that's uniform, and it's actually a good thing for coffee to be uniform, even if it's uniformly horrible across the board. It will sell. Because it's a consistency issue, and that's, you know, in a traditional world, that's very highly valued. We're almost at the point where we need to cup because we have an hour of cupping. We're going to probably take a five-minute break or something and then go to cupping. But let me finish this. Here's a quick tabulation. If you had sevens all the way across, plus